Our first reading this morning is Revelation chapter 2, verses 14 to 22. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the people of Israel, so that they would eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice fornication. So you also have some who hold to the teaching of Nicolaitans. Repent then. If not, I will come to you soon and make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give some of the hidden mana and will give a white stone and on the white stone is written a new name that no one knows except the one who receives it. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love, faith, service, and patient endurance. I know that your last works are greater than the first. But I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet and is teaching and beguiling my servants to practice fornication and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I give her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her fornication. Beware. I am throwing her on a bed, and those who commit adultery with her, I am throwing into great distress unless they repent of her doings. Our second reading today comes from the book of Esther. And the book of Esther only shows up once in the lectionary. Uh, which means it's kind of hard to cover the whole of the story. So I was glad that we got to do that with the children so you catch some of it. And we'll tell it again in a more adult way uh, in the sermon. But listen now to chapter 4, verses 11 through 17. Now let me start with 9. Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a message from Mordecai, saying, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes in to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law. All alike are to be put to death. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone, may that person live. I myself have not been called to come in to the king for thirty days. When they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter, but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and neither eat nor drink for three days, night nor day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. This is the word of the Lord. Last week, I started a sermon series called Being Distinct. Um, and I talked about how our ability to blend in has deprived us of the ability to stand out. And that the church thrives when it makes a public witness of its faithfulness and stands in contrast to the faithlessness of the world. But being distinct is really only part of this series and only part of this story. What I really want to talk about is how do Christians use our power in a non-Christian world? How do we navigate 
navigate the privileges that we have as being people who can fit in when we want to and who can not fit in when we don't want, want to. How do we use our power and privilege as people? So last week I talked about how we are called to be salt and light. And when we choose to be Christians in a world that is decidedly not, the church thrives. This week we're going to go deeper in what it means to choose to be Christian in a world that is not. Sometimes it's dangerous. Choosing to be distinctly Christian often means making a dangerous choice to suffer in solidarity with our neighbors. But... Solidarity saves. Solidarity brings salvation. It is a life-giving choice. It is a protecting choice. And what Christ calls us to is a deep solidarity with all those who suffer, with all those who hurt. When we choose privilege over our neighbor, we hurt our neighbors and we hurt ourselves. On the other hand, when we choose our neighbors over safety, we protect each other. Solidarity saves. And I'm going to tell you two stories, a negative example and a positive example, to talk about how and why and what this means for the world that we live in. The first story comes from a, a book that was turned into a movie and turned into a movie again. The book is called Imitation of Life. It was, um, I'm familiar with the 1959 movie with uh, Lana Turner. It's a story of two couples, two, two couples, two families, uh, there is uh, Laura and Annie. Laura is white and Annie was black. And they're both having some trouble and they bind together, they come and they live with each other. Each of them has a daughter. And Annie's daughter, Sarah Jane, is light-skinned enough that she can pass as a white person. And Sarah Jane resents deeply the way that she is treated unfairly and cruelly by society because of who her mother is. She hates it. And the first thing that she does when she's able to go off on her own, she tells her mother that she is going to work in a library and that she moves to New York and starts passing herself off as a white woman. And Annie goes to see her and she finds that she's not in the library, but it turns out she has been working as a dancer. And Annie goes to her um, and when she confronts her in the space and declares that she is her mother, Sarah Jane rejects her disowns her, says, leave me alone forever, and it hurts Annie deeply. Annie's health is never the same after that point. Sarah Jane uh, goes off and, and lives her life alone, by herself, away from the family that had raised her, because she wants the privileges that she cannot have while also acknowledging who her mother is. Annie goes to see her one more time. She visits her in California just to say, I love you. You can, you can live as whoever you want. I won't judge you. I won't interfere. I won't condemn you. And they hug, and her roommate comes in right at the moment they, that they hug. And Sarah Jane passes her mother off as an old maid from when she was younger. From that point forward, Annie's heart is absolutely broken. And she gets sicker and sicker and sicker, and then she dies. And when she dies, her, the, the family that she had lived with the whole time uh, follows her wishes and offers her this gigantic state funeral. There's a, a huge carriage and there are white horses and there's a marching band playing when the saints go marching in and they're all uh, making a procession down the street and there are throngs of people everywhere and through the throngs we hear Sarah Jane and she's and she's pushing her way through all the people, screaming, I am her daughter, I am her daughter, let me in. And she makes her way into the car where the people from Annie's chosen family are, and she says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so, so sorry. But of course, it is too late. The only thing that her family can do is hold her and hug her and comfort her. When we choose to abandon people who suffer, we do harm to the people who suffer. And we also do harm to ourselves. 
Of course, the, the story that this tells is a story that is deeply affected by American racism. If, if racism weren't the dominant uh, way that people interact with each other at that time, then we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't have such a story. But Sarah Jane chose to abandon her mother to the suffering uh, that she was going to endure at the hands of a cruel world. And in the end, she comes to regret it because that suffering destroyed the loving relationship that she had. And that suffering prevented her from being there for her mother during this time of difficulty and trial. When we abandon our neighbors, when we abandon those who suffer, when we choose to use our privilege to protect ourselves and set ourselves aside from other people, we hurt them deeply. Oftentimes, they experience that hurt bodily and cruelly. But we also hurt ourselves. Maybe not in the same physical way, but there's a deep spiritual wound to the cruelty of abandoning them. And that's something that we see in Sarah Jane's regret at the end of the movie, is that she is heartbroken by her own unwillingness to love and let herself be loved. Now, on the other side of that is the truth that solidarity saves. When we choose to be with one another, when we choose not to use our privilege to hold ourselves apart from the suffering of other people, but instead to use our privilege to set ourselves in the midst of the suffering of other people, we save, we protect, we deliver. And that is exactly what is going on in the story of Esther. And whenever we preach on the story of Esther, we have to tell the whole story because it doesn't make sense without telling the whole story. And the story begins with my favorite character in the Bible. And I know it's not, not quite related, but you just have to know about Vashti. Vashti is King Ahasuerus' first wife. And King Ahasuerus has this gigantic party for all of the officials in his kingdom. And Vashti has a concurrent party for all of the women who are, I suppose, are married to the officials in the kingdom. So there's these two separate parties, and King Ahasuerus is having a good old time, and he's drinking, and all of his advisors are drinking, and he call, he sends uh, one of his eunuchs over to uh, the, the sort of women's party and says, bring Vashti over here and, and let her show off how beautiful she is. I want everybody to see her beauty. And Vashti says, no. She refuses to be an object. I'm going to give you a hint. This is an old story. It's not going to go very well. Um, <laughs> so, of course, the, the king, you know, his advisors are right there, and they've been drinking too, and they're sitting there, you know, with their beers in their hands, and they're saying, you can't let this happen. What, what if other people start to refuse to be objects? What if everybody starts to emulate Vashti the, the whole world will get turned upside down. And you know what? They're right. Because it only takes one person to stand up for themselves, to insist on human dignity for themselves, in order to inspire a whole generation to hold themselves in a higher esteem, to treat themselves as the children of God. That's why you got to know about Vashti. But, of course, this is a story about Esther. And the end of the story of Vashti uh, is that the king sends her away and he starts looking for a new wife. Somebody else to embody the submissive object of my desire role. Um, and the way they do that is they gather up all of the beautiful women from the, the, the whole of the empire and they bring them into the king's harem. And they pluck them and they print them and they help them conform to the beauty standards of the day and they uh, prepare them and they try to help them get rid of their accents and then one by one they go into the king for a date. And they have a date and if the king likes them then the king will ask them back on another date. It is exactly like The Bachelor. <laughs> it is truly uncanny. 
And the person who wins the final rose is Esther. <laughs> Esther's Jewish name was Hadassah. Esther, um, her parents died when she was very young, and Mordecai had raised her like a daughter for himself. And when she goes to be in the king's era, Mordecai tells her not to tell anyone that she's Jewish. Mordecai was among those people who had been captured and taken away from Jerusalem. He has seen things, and he knows that it won't be safe for her. And so Esther becomes the queen. And in the meantime, Mordecai also has his own life. Mordecai saves the king from a plot to, uh, to assassinate the king. Um, and then Mordecai also refuses to bow down to Haman. I told this story with the kids. Haman loved to have people bow down to him, and Mordecai won't bow down. And Mordecai goes, uh, and Mordecai refuses to bow down, and Haman goes to the king. And Haman says, listen, king, I've got to tell you, there are these people in our country who are not really Persians. They don't really belong here in our country. They have their own customs. They have their own language and laws. They have their own ways of doing things. They don't worship like we worship. Some of them didn't even bother to learn English. <coughs> And Haman says, I've got a few million dollars. And I've got a solution to this problem. You just sign this edict declaring the extermination of the Jews. And I will donate to your campaign millions of dollars. And you might not know this. You think kings are rich, but kings always need money because they've got to pay off all the people that you need to pay off in order to stay the king. And so the king says, no skin off my back and he signs it. And they post it in all the places that they posted laws. They give it to courtiers. And courtiers ride on their horses and pronounce it in all the public squares. And very quickly, all of the Jews know that in about a month's time, they are doomed to death. And the word guy puts on sackcloth and ashes. And there he is outside the gate. And he's screaming and crying all day, every day, morning, lamenting, right? This is a, a part of what it is to be people of faith. We lament, we call God in to our problems so that we are not alone in our problems, we are with God in our problems. And eventually Esther hears that Mordecai is pitching a fit. Uh, and she asks him, what is going on? And Mordecai explains via a messenger, because she's up in a king's hair and she can't be talking to a man, uh, via a messenger that uh, all of that, that has happened, and Mordecai says, do something. And Esther says, I can't. Don't you see? I'm good. I would die. I would die. If, if I go into the king, there's a law that says, if you go into the king without an invitation, you will get killed. There's only, there's only just the slimmest chance that the king would hand out your golden scepter. And then we hear this prophecy profound thing from Mordecai, one of the most beautiful verses in the book of Esther, perhaps you have come to a royal dignity for such a time as this. Maybe that's why you're here. And Esther says, all right, pray for me, what do you do? Now there's some complexity to how, they, how she does it, it takes like two chapters, but the, the long story short, she goes to the king and she says, I'm Jewish, and you have condemned me to death along with all of these other people. And suddenly the king's eyes are opened. Because instead of the Jews being some distant people who are different from him and don't fit in and he doesn't know any Jews, instead it's his pain, right? Instead, it's somebody that he knows and somebody that he loves. And because it's somebody that he knows and somebody that he loves, the king says, of course, of course, I will stop it. And Haman gets his comeuppance, and Mordecai takes off his sackcloth and ashes and puts on rejoicing, and Esther saves her people. Esther had a choice. Her choice was... Is she going to stand up 
or sit back? Her choice is, is she going to pass as a Persian? Or is she going to be distinct as a Jew? It was a dangerous choice. She didn't know how the king would respond. All she could do was decide whether or not she would trust God enough to do it. And can I tell you something very strange about the book of Esther? It does not mention God once. At no point does it, it use the name of God. There's praying, there's prayer, there's Judaism. But at no point do we hear God. And, and that tells us, I think, something really hard about the world today, which is when things are going sour, when things are, are tough and rough and we don't know how it's going, it can be really, really hard to see God. God is not obvious. But of course, God was there. God had guided Esther to this place so that she could deliver her people. God had given her the strength so that she could be brave. God had given her the wisdom of Mordecai. God was throughout the story that sometimes even, sometimes we don't feel like God is there, even when God is guiding us the entire time. But if she chooses to pass as Persian, she might be safe. But of course, passing as Persian will do real harm for the people that she loves. On the other hand, she can choose to identify as a Jew. She can choose to be in solidarity with her people. But of course, if she is in solidarity with her people, she might just share their fate. What she chose was solidarity. And because of that, she saved all of her people. Solidarity saves. <coughs> now, you guys are great, and I love you. But you're probably not going to sing the land of the blues, However, over and over again in your lives, you will be asked to make a choice about who you are going to be in the are you going to calmly accept the benefits of an unfair society? Are you going to stand up? Are you going to sit back? Are you going to choose to stand in solidarity with those who hurt, with those who suffer, with those who are being broken by an unjust system? When somebody is bullied at school, you have a choice to make, right? You can let it happen, or you can turn that bully on you. If you stand, if you pick a side, you, you've, you've picked what is going to be. Either you let it happen, or you stand up to the bully, and you acknowledge that you will now be the target of bullying. But of course, when there are two people that are the targets of bullying, there's a very different experience, because you cannot be alone anymore. Maybe at work, they're making a change that you know is going to harm people that you love. Or maybe it's going to harm people that you don't know, but have the conviction that they are children of God. You have to make that choice. Just like Esther made, am I going to speak up? Am I going to try to change this at the risk of my career? Or am I going to sit back and watch and let it happen? When you choose to side with the poor, with the broken, with the oppressed, you save. That's the truth. That's how the world is. To be distinctly Christian is to make this choice. And the reason for that is because ultimately that's what Christ did. We're going to talk about it next week in more detail, but... Christ had all the power in the world, right? Christ is God. And Christ chose to come and be human, to be like us, to take on solidarity with humanity, to take on the weakness of human flesh, to take on the pain of human flesh, to take on the cruelty that humans enact upon each other. And because Christ took on humanity, Christ 
saved. Solidarity saves. And in the same way, Christ didn't just take on any humanity. Christ took on the humanity of someone who was poor, someone who was a minority in their community, in an oppressed community, somebody who was rejected as a criminal, as a terrorist, as an enemy of the people. He stood, he had not done any of those things, but he stood in solidarity with all of those people who are persecuted justly or unjustly. And he lifted all of us, all of us up into salvation. This is what the cross is. It is a choice on, the, on behalf of the one who had all power instead of using that power for his own gain, abandoned it, forsook that power, and instead chose solidarity with us. And in choosing that solidarity, we became one with God, and the power of God became not the power to oppress or hurt or betray, but the power to redeem, to overcome anything, even death, and to carry us forward into eternal life. Now, I imagine that as you have heard the story of Esther, you have heard echoes. Echoes that are reflected in the world today, in our country, in our world, maybe in your lives. When I read the stories in the Bible, I'm always struck by how incredibly relevant they are. Those echoes tell us that there is a way to be Christians in the world, and it is the calling to be in solidarity with each other. I invite you to listen to those echoes in the story. Look at the world that you are in and make the brave choices that Esther made, that Jesus made. Perhaps you were brought to this place for just such a time as this. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.